Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alain Martin. Uh, welcome to our Horasis panel titled Preparing for the New Pandemics, Lessons for over three years ago, a seven-year-old child in my family was diagnosed with level three cancer. He went through a terrible ordeal, but thanks to unwavering and caring professionals like our team members, his loving siblings, teachers, and parents, he fully recovered and developed resilience. He was actually infected with COVID a couple of days after his chemotherapy was over, but again, he recovered without single symptoms so far. I'm also here because I have been inspired by Dr. Paul Farmer. Since we met in 2003, uh, 2008, I kept in front of me his words of wisdom. The idea that some lives matter less is at the root of all that's wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. Thus, we are all here so that neither a child nor any human being today or in the future should suffer or die. They all deserve the care my grandchild had. We have a full agenda. Let's start now. Okay, we are going to start with uh, Doctor with, with Doctor Sylvie Bryan from the World Health Organization. She's responsible for emerging pandemics and for fighting the current pandemic. Mm -hmm. Sylvie, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks a lot for uh, this invitation. I will talk about uh, infodemic. Uh, infodemic is a tsunami of uh, information, some accurate, some not, that spreads alongside a disease outbreak. And uh, we have seen during uh, the 2000, to the COVID-19 pandemic, an unprecedented infodemic. Uh, because during the, this type of event, the rise of the number of cases of disease is mirrored by an increase in the volume of information related to the disease. During this pandemic, the speed with which information has been produced, curated, manipulated and shared, and the number of people reached is unprecedented. And this has renewed attention to the importance and impact of information during health crisis. While it's impossible to eliminate infodemics, it's possible to manage it. First, let me, tell, let me tell you why uh, this infodemic has been unprecedented. Because first, this crisis is global and all countries and communities have been affected in different contexts and background, and the conversation has been happening in different languages. Second, because the world is hyper-connected, both physically and virtually. And in the digital age, with broad access to social media, the challenges of infodemic management have been magnified. Rumors of fake news are spreading further and faster than ever. Third, because the disease is new, there are many gaps in knowledge, leading to a variety of interpretation of scarce and evolving information. While new research continues to emerge, the finding and insights it generates are fragmented, and new evidence can sometimes contradict previous guidance. In addition, the quality of research varies widely, and this shifting landscape has led to confusion as policymakers and the public have attempted to interpret the growing volume of evidence. Fourth, every epidemic generates fear fueled by uncertainty, and this can affect the quality of conversation and provide more opportunities for dubious theories to be spread and adopted. The fear and anxiety that accompany pandemics may also affect our ability to objectively evaluate information about the pandemic. So the impact of infodemic during this pandemic has been huge. First, we have had an impact on the uh, mortality itself because we have seen, for instance, in Iran, 700 people dying uh, based on the absorption of methanol, because this was proposed as a, a miraculous cure to COVID-19. It has had an impact on stigma on certain groups. And for instance, in India, 
healthcare workers are being um, violently um, attacked uh, by people because the population thought that they were the ones spreading the disease. Um, it has had also an impact on, on social cohesiveness because it has increased the divide in society between elderly and youth, uh, between uh, uh, the majority and minorities and so on. And finally, it has been a very, uh, an, it has an important impact on, on the trust. And as you all know, the trust is very important to manage uh, epidemics and pandemic. And because infodemic has undermined the trust of the population in, in government, in science, in expertise, in health systems, uh, it has been uh, really a challenge uh, to manage it and also to uh, mitigate its impact on societies. I think it's important also to differentiate misinformation and disinformation. Uh, misinformation is really something we can manage better by providing um, good information or accurate information at the right time, at the right format, so that people can change behavior and adopt healthy behavior. While disinformation, really, there is an attempt to um, harm, and, and this is more complex uh, to deal with. But what can we learn from this uh, first uh, year of the pandemic? Uh, firstly, that infodemic requires a global management and engagement and collaboration across different sectors, from private, public, social media platform, traditional media, civil society, government, international, regional, national, and local institution and organization. Second, that we can leverage new technology to better manage infodemic in the 21st century. Indeed, we have developed tools, for instance, to listen to the conversation in social media so that we can understand the concern of the population in a real time and answer to that question also with the right information. And also, we also have with these new tools the capacity to also monitor the sentiment of the population, whether well, the population is angry, anxious, or what are the feelings they have uh, for certain measures. And this also helps to calibrate uh, the information we are providing and the communication. And the third thing is that we learned that it's extremely important to engage the communities and to empower them to be part of the response. And in this, uh, infodemic management should absolutely rely on the engagement of community and their empowerment so that we are all together in fighting the pandemic. And I will hand here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvie, Dr. Bryant. Uh, next is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Arnaud Fontanet, who is the Director of Global Health at the Pasteur Institute and member of the Advisory Council on COVID in France. So, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Anna, for inviting me to this uh, session. Um, I'm going to discuss with you the uh, sort of um, difficulties and reasoning that scientists uh, go through when exploring a new virus. I'm myself an epidemiologist. I'm specialized in studying the modes of transmission of viruses. And when this new coronavirus emerged a year ago, um, as all scientists, you know, we started with some form of cognitive biases. It was a coronavirus. It was close to what we knew uh, are uh, viruses called SARS and MERS, SARS emerged in 2003 in China, MERS in 2012 in the Gulf countries. And they share in common that these are respiratory viruses and responsible for lower respiratory infections. And we basically felt like this new coronavirus would probably behave the same way. And that was also sort of corroborated by the first information we got from China about nature of disease, clinical symptoms, and, and so on and so forth. Starting from there, um, we also had this notion that most respiratory viruses are transmitted with large droplets, you know, where you would be at risk if you are at a physical distance of less of one or two meters, and where contaminated surfaces would be the other ways you can get infected yourself, which means that you need to clean surfaces and have a very strict hand hygiene. But basically, we were functioning on those sort of uh, 
knowledge. You know? And the one of large droplets is something that goes back to maybe the 70 years ago, you know, so something that is now very much into the minds of scientists, epidemiologists, but had not been so much challenged so far because there had not been an urgency of trying to think differently. And this was really the first time we are facing such a fever pandemic, as you know, if I put on the side, those flu uh, pandemic and, uh, and AIDS, of course. But um, the story that we learn has been very different with these new viruses. And the sort of challenges we had with this cognitive bias or dogma were first that we realized as opposed to what we had seen with SARS and MERS, that some people could be symptomatic very early in the natural infection, um, history of the natural infection. Basically, they could be some, con they could be contagious. A um, couple of days before the onset of symptoms, and they were very contagious at the onset of symptoms. So whereas with SARS and MERS, you had to wait four or five days before people were really contagious. And that was first thing that, told us, well, we are not facing a typical coronavirus when it comes to those that give these lower respiratory infections. The second point is that we learned that we had a lot of uh, clusters indoors, but not in hospitals like we had with SARS and MERS, but we had community clusters, indoors community clusters. And that also was telling us different stories. SARS and MERS were really hospital-based, but not uh, this new coronavirus. Then came some um, findings from our colleagues from Germany, telling us that the virus was very much in the throat of the patients, not in their lungs. And, and, and the concentration of virus you could find in the throat could be 1,000 times higher compared to what you would find for SARS, I mean, the one responsible for the lung disease of 2003 in China. And then some people working in the area of physics came and said, well, you should really revisit this concept of large droplets transmission and see what contribution aerosols could have. You know, these very tiny particles, less than five micron diameter, um, that can stay in suspension in the air, that can float in the air, and they don't fall immediately on the floor, like with the large droplets do at, at distance of one to two meters. And then when you start to put together all those findings, and uh, you can start to build a new model where you realize that with very high concentration of the virus in the throat, then you reach concentrations high enough so that even these very tiny particles, less than five micron of diameter aerosols, can contain infectious viruses. And then that would explain uh, why uh, you would be, uh, you would have this sort of indoors clusters, you know, in community. And here again, uh, you see that because the virus is present in the throat very early in the disease, uh, at the onset of symptoms, because people can be contagious that early. And you do not have to wait, like for MERS and SARS, the five days of uh, infection and, and symptoms before those uh, viruses present in the deep depth of your lungs become contagious when you cough. Here the system is, the mechanism is totally different. It's a virus present very early in the throat, very high concentration, enough so that when you speak, you can project aerosols that stay in suspension in the air, and that makes indoor environment uh, contagious. And all that ended up with challenging the story that we were saying, well, that the mask, of course, is very useful, but the mask is uh, to protect people around you and uh, when you cannot keep a physical distance of one or two meters, you know. But uh, we realized that the indoor environment could become at risk and the mask was useful in any circumstances when you were indoors, not uh, only when you are very close to people. And, and that has been really a challenge and even for, for, for policymakers, you know, and people making guidelines, uh, having to challenge this knowledge that we had for more than 70 years and accepting the idea that wearing a mask in community was becoming important, particularly indoors, even if you are at long distance with other people, uh, that the need to open the windows would really make a change in, in the way you protect yourself against the disease. And even in community, when you walk in the streets, of course, the aerosol is much less of a risk when you are outdoors, but still you cross people, you meet friends, you start to talk. All that has, for me, has been a very educational experience because we gradually had to shift from an old model to a new one. 
and coming with policies that probably have an impact on the way the transmission is going on now and I think will be useful for future pandemics. And again, always be open-minded and ready not to, of course, you need at the beginning of an, um, a new emerging virus to stick to some of your knowledge, you know, but you have to be open-minded and ready to challenge it when the facts start to contradict what you had learned so far. So this is what I wanted just to share with you as a humble scientist who has learned a lot in the past year. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fontanet. Uh, the next is uh, Dr. Uh, um, Harold Noel from Santé Publique France, or Public Health of France. And uh, Harold works in the field every day, so he's in proximity with the patients every day, and that's why he's with, with us today. Go ahead, Harold. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to this uh, panel. Um, I would like to stress two main lessons learned from uh, this COVID pandemic and previous public health emergency to try to accelerate knowledge building. Um, first, we had the first paradigm shift, and therefore I will, I will uh, paraphrase uh, Dr. Tedros uh, Andamon Gebrius, was test, 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 and we have to do that even when the case number is skyrocketing. It was really important for us to uh, upscale our diagnostic capacity, and it helped us in many ways. It helped us, for sure, to better measure the impact but it was also a key factor in the response to uh, address as well the compliance of the population to control measures and to prevent transmission around cases. This information that we got through testing was as well a key factor that allowed us to uh, upscale our capacity to uh, do some uh, genomic surveillance and, of course, to follow the, the question that we have right now with the different variants of concern and all the variants of the COVID, in this COVID crisis. So all this information with testing was challenging. It, should, it is challenging for industrial countries and for developing countries, but it should happen every time. It will bring us more information. It will bring us the capacity to really tailor our, our response. And uh, even though it can be challenging, I would recommend that. And that should be one of the first message that I took from uh, this uh, crisis. The second one that I would like to, to stress is uh, maybe in answer to how can we update our knowledge quicker when the facts contradict our prerequisites or cognitive bias, like Arnaud said. I think that for that, we have to move away from hospital and healthcare setting and try to build knowledge from the community. Go where the cases are, where they get infected, where, where they get infected, and where they have their connection and where they will infect other people. This means that we have to, do, to go more for population-based data, population-based investigation, population-based surveillance, um, try to implement as quickly and be ready to implement as quickly as possible every time that uh, a pathogen with a pandemic potential emerge, we have to be quick to implement several epidemiological studies, uh, studies that will document the root and transmission, studies that will document risk factor, but also include social sciences to get to know what are the knowledge, the attitude, and the practices in terms of prevention or risk uh, of the population to better tailor our response measures. So um, this, for me, is the, really the key things that we have seen during this pandemic, but I'm very happy to discuss further if there is some further question because we learned a lot from this uh, crisis and the crisis before that. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with uh, these three points and I'm ready for further discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Noel. Uh, next is Professor Albert Bosch, who is the president of the Virological Society of Spain and professor of microbiology and virology. And uh, Professor Bosch has also been a member of the COVID group or COVID committee of the government of Spain. Please go ahead, uh, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. And, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm very honored. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a virologist and I've been my entire life working with uh, enteric viruses so that our viruses that are shed in the, in the stool of infected individuals and that ultimately they reach uh, wastewaters. So uh, we are really conducting a, a surveillance based on wastewater-based epidemiology, actually, which means that we are tracing the circulation of the virus among the population through 
the occurrence of SARS-CoV-2 in, in wastewater. Actually, uh, there's a, a prolonged presence of the virus of SARS-CoV-2 in fecal samples for between 7 and, and 21 days after the onset of symptoms. There's also uh, the positivity in, in stool is actually longer than in respiratory, respiratory samples. Okay, So this, uh, this really uh, is the, the reason why it's, it's so frequently found in, in, in wastewater samples. And uh, wastewater surveillance is a non-invasive system in which you can sample uh, a large number of individuals at, at, uh, at, with one single sample, actually. So, for instance, in one of the huge wastewater treatment plants that we, that we study, we can have a glance on what's going on, for instance, in, in 85% of all the metropolitan area of Barcelona, for instance. Okay? And we are conducting this, uh, this, this same approach all over Spain. So we have uh, wastewater treatment plant samples that get to our lab, and then we, in 24, 48 hours, uh, we provide uh, the number of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, numbers in, in, in wastewater. And this provides an, an idea of what of how is the circulation. If it's stable, it's going down, going up, etc. Okay, And in this way, we have been able to anticipate some some hot spots in the circulation of the virus. And, and and uh, the health authorities have then on, under, undergone through uh, specific PCR assays or, or, I mean, taking measures to really anticipate outbreaks and try to minimize the effect of these outbreaks. Okay. So, and at the same time, it proves the efficiency of some maybe unpopular measures like could be, I don't know, closing bars, closing restaurants, or even a complete lockdown as we had. And we could evidence that the virus was no longer present in wastewater at the end of the lockdown. Then all of a sudden it came back again to be there when, you know, when restrictions were, you know, were disappeared, you know. So it's, it means it's really, it's a very, it's a very useful tool to complement obviously other tools like, like the clinical surveillance, of course. Actually, uh, I just received a commission recommendation of the European Commission uh, of, of, of yesterday that uh, the commission asked for a common approach to establish a systematic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 and the variants in wastewater. Actually, we are finding the variants already. We are, we are finding the the, the UK variant, the B117, and we are looking for the South African variant, etc. So, so really, it provides a very comprehensive uh, idea of what's circulating. I'll stop here, and I'll be very happy if we can discuss further these points. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bosch. Uh, the next is uh, Dr. Mark Feinberg, who is the president of the International Vaccine Alliance and with uh, also a long track record as a physician and epidemiologist. So go ahead, Mark. Thanks very much, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, you know, in my comments, I think want to sort of take it at a higher level, the uh, thinking about um, what we've learned from the COVID pandemic, what we've learned from earlier pandemics and how we can bring together um, you know, the global health community in a more strategic and proactive way to prepare for um, future pandemics, which we know are going to exist. I think all of the speakers, their interventions have been very informative and there have been common themes about how, you know, we needed to change the way we were thinking in response to the COVID uh, pandemic, that earlier conceptions were not adequate necessarily to deal with this and some fundamental insights, if they were available sooner, would have made a big difference. And in, in many ways, I think we would all agree that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic from a scientific and public health perspective has been really um, tremendous. Amazing progress has been made in record time. Really highly innovative approaches have really come forward in ways that people might not have previously imagined. And new partnerships between public sector entities and private sector entities, and even between private sector entities themselves in ways that were previously unimaginable are now a reality, but still all of that progress um, has not been enough. Um, and if we had really been better prepared for this, we would have done better. And, and there's really not a good reason 
for why we weren't better prepared. There are lessons from earlier, um, you know, emerging infectious diseases emerging from, you know, so-called reservoir hosts that have entered the human population. Um, and we've known that this can happen. We need to know how to sort of better prepare for future pandemics. You know, my perspectives on this is really shaped from the time when I was in medical school and graduate school in the San Francisco Bay Area, coincident with when the AIDS epidemic emerged. And at that time, that was you know, quite shocking because the dogma in among the experts in infectious diseases was we would not see any new infectious diseases that we already knew about all the ones that would ever afflict human beings. And we now know that that was fundamentally wrong and AIDS taught us that. And we should have really sort of anticipated that there would be future emerging zoonotic infections that would become pandemic in the human population. It wasn't really then a question of if, it was a question of when. There were a number of important lessons that the response to the AIDS pandemic taught us, and one is that you know, scientific innovation is an essential element of the public health response. Um, you know, Mark? Yes. So much bother you. Somebody is saying that, uh, do you have your microphone on? Y I think it's on, it's green on my side, but yeah. unless it, it's well, their I, problem on, you, on their side. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We yeah. can all hear you. So, so it's on. not on our side. Thank you. The one the modern science. Yeah. So lesson number two is that equitable access to the fruits of scientific innovation is, is not, uh, is both necessary and possible. You know, thirdly, the public sector and the private sector need to work together in a more proactive and strategic way. And, and that is really going to be essential. And the effectiveness of how well we do in the response is going to determine um, whether we make good progress or not. And lastly, I think all of us can agree that we learned that the world is a very small place and that what happens in a distant land can affect people all around the world. And we are, in fact, a global community and we need to act that way. I think all of the speakers previously have highlighted what has been learned um, in their specific areas. And we just need to bring all these different threads together. You know, my other important experience in the space was shaped by the response to the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016, where I led the Ebola vaccine development efforts at, at Merck. And that was another example of we should have been better prepared for that outbreak. And in fact, the vaccine that ultimately proved successful had been developed 10 years earlier, but had never advanced into human testing because people didn't think it was necessary. So it's sort of the lack of imagination that affected us. You know, fortunately, after the Ebola outbreak, the global community recognized that we need to be better prepared. And that led to the creation of an organization that I was you know, helping to champion as well called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations or CEPI, which is intended to really be proactive to develop vaccines against known emerging threats as well as be better prepared for so-called disease X, which you know, SARS-CoV-2 turned out to be a pathogen we hadn't previously seen before. You know, CEPI's made significant progress, but CEPI is you know, susceptible to donor funding and government priorities. And those are things that often wane when the emerging threat or the active threat um, you know, disappears. Um, we have short memory spans and that I think is a big risk in and of itself. Um, and clearly, you know, COVID has taught us lots of new lessons. And I think the challenge for all of us and just my closing thoughts is you know, really, how do we learn from our different experiences that have, we've accrued with some, you know, pain um, in the course? When the COVID pandemic um, may wane. Um, you know, it's likely not going to d disappear, but it will be with us, you know, for the long term. But, you know, we really need to be more proactive, be more engaged, create new partnerships and generate new investment. And I, you know, recommend a, a re article that just came out today in The Lancet from uh, Nikki Laurie and colleagues that, you know, was basically calling for 
a global integrated um, research and development and financing mechanism to prepare for future pandemics. And I completely endorse you know, what they're recommending because we've learned so much, but if we don't bring it all together strategically, that will be a tragedy um, that is our response. Thank you. We absolutely have to work together in sync. And uh, uh, we're going to move to the questions. We have another few minutes, maybe uh, eight minutes. Um, the first question I have for the team is most of our leaders face an unrelenting cluster of daily issues dominated by the crisis du jour, i.e. events that shake deeply held beliefs or the status quo. As a result, they tend to be crisis and surprise event driven while assuming they are mission driven. When the pressure from COVID tapers off, there is a huge risk that preparing for the next pandemic will be relegated to a back burner seat, notwithstanding the fact that the next pathogen to hit us could result in a greater morbidity and mortality. Universities and research centers cannot face the challenge alone. Intense alliances must be secured between WHO, World Health Organization, World Health Organization for Animal Health, OIE, governments, local and national, to the EU or ed and educational institutions, information intermediaries and civil societies. How can we secure that complacency will not leave the progress on science and policy to the next round? Please go ahead, Wh whoever wants to, to address it. Well, I think that's you know exactly the point I was trying to make, Elaine. Um, I, I, I do think if we don't you know, come together and apply the lessons we've learned, that will be a, a, a major oversight. I, I, my, I, I'm an optimistic person. I think COVID is different. I mean, we didn't learn the lesson from, um, you know, HIV. We didn't learn it from avian flu. We didn't learn it from SARS or MERS um, or Zika, but, you know, or Ebola. Now we, we do need to address this issue specifically. I mean, I think there's enough awareness that, this sort of short attention span is, is highly problematic, that I think it's incumbent upon all of us to advocate for, you know, continued and greater, uh, more collaborative approaches and, you know, dedicated investment to make sure that these, you know, integrated creative approaches can come. Thank you. The next question is from Professor Mukhtar Hajizada. Um, what are the global risks of strict lockdown for one month and then the totally resuming the normal life in some countries? Would it be not better to observe some consistency in the decision-making rather than chasing the figures? Thanks a lot. Who would like to address it? I don't know. I, I, can, I can say something. It's not, obviously it's not my expertise, but I've been uh, living, I, I live in a country that relies a lot on tourism and then in you know in, in bars restaurants and, and life and nightlife and we've seen the, the efficacy of of restrictive measures I mean it's a sacrifice that we need to take and it's an investment for the future you know if we don't really stick to strict uh, measures then we we have the the risk to have a, a you know a, a very long crisis that would at the end ultimately be much worse for the economy as well. And as I say, I have nothing to do with economy. I'm, I'm the worst guy in economy on on earth. But I mean, it's something that I've seen. You know that we have right after right after the lockdown. You know we open uh, the restrictions and we had a, a new wave. Then we had to you know had to save Christmas and now we are suffering from that. So I mean, it's we must we must be really very careful for the future. Thank you. Um, any question to each other before we go to the wrap up? Any member of the panel would yes. Or maybe ahead. if I could uh, address the previous question, uh, I think that on my daily activities on my daily routine work, we need more time, long term thinking. Um, I think it would be very useful if some pandemic prevention program could be set up for a certain number of years, at least five to 10 years programs with regular revision, regular evaluation and regular assessments by independent 
uh, bodies. I, would, I mean like bodies independent from today-to-day -to -day politics. Because every time our plan failed, it was because another more urgent matter or concern took over and the pandemic program prevention took the back seat. So we will need this kind of thing to work at the national level. And that's what, we, that's what I would advocate for uh, in my country, for instance. I met uh, a Nobel laureate in Barcelona uh, a couple of years ago, and I asked her to join us. And unfortunately, she can't do it this time. And I asked her, how, does she, what, how much time does she devote to COVID-19? And she said, I do work on it, but I do the minimum to stay out of jail because I'm more worried about the future pandemic. So she does work on, on it. But she, and I asked her, how do you express the minimum to stay out of jail? She said, one third of my time is on issues that are common to the current pathology and the future pandemics. One third of my time is only on current and the next third is only on future pathologies. So she has one third, one third as her day-to-day -day agenda as a guidance, which she can adjust. Uh, let's move to the wrap-up. We're going to reverse sequence, except for Mark, who will be the last. And uh, to maybe up to a minute, we have still two, three minutes. So maybe a few seconds for, for each of us. Uh, so um, who was before, uh, before Mark? Uh, Albert, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to, um, I mean, in my case, um, I really trust uh, wastewater-based epidemiology because we are covering not only symptomatic uh, mm -hmm. patients, but also asymptomatic shedders. Okay, so we have a complete picture. And I, I do believe that this, for instance, can be interesting to trace uh, vaccine escape variants that we really scare us a lot about this possibility. And I'm convinced that the, the planning and the preparedness for next pandemic will be a, a one health approach. Okay, so having not only uh, the clinical side, the environmental side, the veterinarian side. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a complete picture what we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please uh, go ahead. Uh, Harold, I think. Okay. Uh, if I could wrap up in a very short time, uh, what I always say to my colleagues, because we tend to forget it, is that actually this pandemic, they come from a mechanism that is the base of every biological science, it's evolution. Uh, we have to adapt and evolve faster than what the, the, the pathogens that we're fighting. So the lesson I learned from this COVID crisis is that in order to evolve, we have to set up clear ways to build knowledge uh, anew and to uh, think ahead and not try to stay in the same cognitive bias that we had before. Uh, this is how this is this is challenging. This is difficult, but that that calls for innovative way to uh, make some surveillance and to and to and to generate data. And that's why uh, the the the, the I, I think that it's really interesting to have such new techniques, like for, for instance, checking the through which where we can, where we can find this pattern and how we can follow them up. I, and I think that uh, in this crisis, and the crisis I think in Chinese has two meanings, like opportunity and danger, there are quite new opportunities and techniques that we were able to develop, all the new strategies that we were able to develop, and I hope they will be uh, not forgotten for the next pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fontanay, Professor Fontanay. Yeah, just to say that um, I think this pandemic, I mean, has also been an incredible accelerator of knowledge. Um, we have seen this in all fields. I mean, I was just mentioning what we have learned about the um, transmission of respiratory viruses, but I mean, you can go into the surveillance and uh, how they made some, um, given some example of it, or uh, Albert as well. The, uh, I think the mRNA 